I want to bring in former United States Senator Mike Gravel. You represent Alaska from 1969 to 1980. He's best known for having been given the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg, who's been on this vigil one time, at least one time before Dan has, because Dan went to the press and, of course, the government stopped in prior restraint, ultimately, the press from continuing to publish. So he went to a few senators, like George McGovern, who was running for president and didn't want anything to do with it, and a couple of other less courageous senators. And then he found Mike Ravel, who was willing to do it. And Mike read the papers into the congressional record during a subcommittee hearing. And the next day was the Supreme Court decision, actually, the very next morning, in which the court ruled that the Times and the Post were right that they cannot be stopped prior to publication. They cannot be prior restraint. But the majority of the judges said that after publication of classified information, they are liable to be arrested. And that's key to the Assange case, because under the Espionage Act, technically, it's a horrific act, but technically, they could get him just for the possession and dissemination of the documents. So, Mike, I know you're a supporter of Julian, and I see Dan Ellsberg right next to you. Dan has joined the show. But let's turn the mic over first to Mike. How are you, Mike? Here you go. Yes, hey. we can, Mike. Yeah, you're hey. the one that controls the mute. <laughs> so, yeah, be careful what you say. I'll mute you. <laughs> no, no, I, I've never been careful what I say. <laughs> I, could, I could care less about those mothers. <laughs> but the, the key thing, it, it's just surprising how sadistic these people are in the, in the system. Sadistic is the word. You know, we used to laud ourselves that we, we, no American would ever act like a, like a German uh, at Auschwitz. Hell, we act like that all the time. And what just happened with John is a case in point. And what they did to Chelsea Manning, the only thing that I can say good about Obama is the pardon, but not much beyond that. Because what Julian is facing is what Obama started. And I think that's not fully understood. I was fortunate. I was gung-ho. I enlisted during the war in Korea. And one of the things I wanted is when I enlisted that I could pick, and I picked uh, the Intelligence Committee. So I was sent to intelligence school at Fort Oliver. And, uh, and then from there, uh, I was sent down to South Carolina. And we were just young men chasing girls. And this wasn't what I signed up for. So uh, they had a circular out that uh, you could go to OCS and they wouldn't extend your sign up, which was four years for me. So I went to OCS, the combat infantry platoon uh, situation. And of course, Ellsberg well knows that the patch that we wore on was follow me. And of course, <laughs> that's what served me when Ellsberg did what he did. Is God damn it, he's, he's gone up the hill. I got to follow him. And, yes. and that's what motivated me to do this. But one of the things that's not clearly understood is that when I was in the, so I go to Europe, you know, thank God, had I gone to Asia uh, with my gun ho attitude, I'd have got my ass shot off. There's no question about that. But so I go to Europe with this good fortune and, uh, and I go to the CIC, which is what my orders were. So I go, I go in with my, my tra transfer papers to the CIC office, and they said, no, no, you, you don't belong here. And I said, what do you mean? No, see that room down the hall on the left? You go there, and then you deliver your papers there. So I go there, and on the door it says CIS, Communications Intelligence Service. And so here I am, a bright second lieutenant, uh, really no experience, two years of college, and, uh, and I'm the adjutant, would you believe that? The position called for a, uh, uh, a captain, but for some reason in the IBM cards, I came up and I was the adjutant. What the hell? I, did, I was so green. Now, I, was, I could take top secret documents. I had several safes behind my desk, and whenever I couldn't afford to go out with my car on the weekend, uh, I would go to the office and sit there, open up these top secret files and read through them. And it, it, was, and, and it was ridiculous, this, the crap that was in there. <laughs> and so I started burning these files because I had the authority to do that. And, and so when, so here I was, I was literally a top secret control officer 
I could classify and declassify, and I was 24 years old, and green is all get out. And so now you advance it to, uh, to I'm a U.S. Senator, and I'm going on 42 years old, and all I can do is go into a room under guard and read the Pentagon Papers, and I couldn't take notes, and obviously no staff. This was ridiculous in my mind, uh, terrible. And so when Dan called my office and spoke to me, I said, would I be willing to use it in my filibuster? Because I was filibustering the draft at the time. And, uh, and, and in a second, I said, yes, <laughs> please hang up. Because I wasn't sure if he was being tailed or I was being tailed. So we did. We met subsequently. And, and uh, in his movie, The Most Dangerous Man in America, that he goes through in some detail <laughs> about what had happened between Dan and myself in the transfer of the documents. So yes. I see, I see uh, uh, Dan, <laughs> Dan there. I'll, I'll let him pick up on uh, our relationship, which was that first phone call that he made. And uh, and I, in fact, I want to I want to put a, a joke on on Dan. Is that Dan? He goes out and he suffers the indignity of being arrested every opportunity he gets, and he's totally committed to causes. I'm committed to the same causes, but I don't get out there and get myself arrested because I, in my heart of hearts, view that protest is, is, is the guarantee that representative government is not working. And I don't even call ourselves democracies, which is bullshit. We're not even close to being a democracy. Uh, and, uh, and so, so what I put Josh Dan on, because he's got so much more experience than, than I have in the intelligence effort, but I josh him on that he goes out there and protests because he's expiating his sins by once being for the war. Now, I was never for the war, so I got no sins to expiate. And even if I did, I'm a former Catholic, and I can't get credit for anything in that area. So, so, so let me turn it over to the great person who caused me to do the right thing, and that's Dan Ellsberg. Dan, you pick up from here. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Great to see you, uh, Mike and Ray, my friends, and John Curiaco and Joe Luria, who uh, helped you, I know, on your book. A terrific book. Yes, literally yeah. honest. You remind me of that first phone call. I uh, remember my, the, I remember the words, I think, that uh, I used when I talked to you, which were, uh, Senator, is it true that you're planning to filibuster on the <laughs> Uh, which was going to keep the draft uh, postponed, at least as long as he filibustered, couldn't pass it. A renewal of the draft, wasn't that it? A reinstitution? It was, it was renewed uh, in September when they broke my filibuster because uh, Mansfield wanted to let John Stennis uh, save face and Nixon save face. So Nixon agreed to let the, uh, let the draft expire two years hence, which was 73. When 73 rolled around, I was still there. And, and John Stennis, being quite the honorable person, he held to the agreement that the draft would expire. So when I always say that I, uh, I was instrumental in ending the draft, and, and that's the terminology that I use, instrumental, because it didn't, they wouldn't let me get credit. And of course, Nixon got credit. But great about Nixon, in one of the books he wrote to try and rejuvenate himself before the American people, he wrote a paragraph saying, that the worst mistake I ever made was agreeing to end the draft. <laughs> I enjoyed that. <laughs> By the way, I, uh, I was impressed that this center, whom I didn't know, I'd read that he was going to filibuster. I had actually tested a couple people on uh, main names here, including Gray Lord Nelson, who had uh, voted against appropriations a few times uh, in connection with the war and had raised questions about it. Uh, I was kind of testing him whether he was a person to go with the Pentagon Papers, and I tried one thing after another. He brushed them all off. Uh, might he filibuster against the war? Might he do this and that? And he seemed pretty burnt out to me at that point. This was in the, back in 1969. Dan, let me add something there that could be helpful to you. Gaylord was, was one of the advisors of uh, McGovern. And I had picked up that uh, Gaylord, subsequently, Gaylord had, is the one that advised McGovern, don't do this, this will destroy your chances of becoming president. 
So I, I just want from Fulbright when he told me that he had. Uh, uh, listen, w with with Nelson, I got so disgusted with him finally, and I was going to see uh, McGovern later. Or no, yeah, I was going to see McGovern later. So at the end, I got up and I said, uh, Senator Nelson, you you've done a lot on the war. You criticize it. There were times in my career when I wish I had done more than I did. And I hope, Senator, you don't finish your career feeling uh, wrong that you had not done more than you actually done. I left him in some, I, I wasn't in a good mood. And I went to see, see McGovern and McGovern said he was gonna use the Pentagon Papers. He had a very different attitude. And I went through the whole thing with him. Um, but he said, give me a week to think about it. And at the end of that week, he did say he couldn't do it after all. And later when I asked, I said, do you mind if we come and discuss at some point? I went in to see him maybe a few weeks later <clears throat> when I was in town. And he said that he had, uh, he had discussed this with a friend, his closest confidant, what you just said, and uh, who had advised him that he shouldn't do it. And he said he seemed to, he guessed, he asked if it, it was your name. Uh, McGovern had earlier said nothing could compel him to uh, reveal my name. You know, he showed the Constitution he, speech clause, isn't it, that he can't be questioned about anything he said on the floor of Congress. He said, they can't even question me. They can't make me tell your name, whatever. And so uh, he said, I did, however, tell a friend. And he asked me, was that Dan Ellsbury? And I said, was that Gaylord Nelson? And <laughs> he had guessed from my little exchange with him that I was the bad guy who was trying to get him into uh, bad waters there. And I didn't hold that against McGovern because he was running for president at that point. And I had said to him earlier that I knew it was very questionable uh, for him to run for president, having put these out. And he said, you know, you know, uh, my source of funding is different from these other guys. And the people who back me won't, won't be bothered by it, he said. But a week later with Gaylord Nelson, he had changed his mind. So uh, here is this guy, Gravel, now, who is going to do a uh, stick his neck out. And by the way, a very good guy that I dealt with earlier, Senator Goodell, who had been, um, uh, who had uh, called for us to get out of Vietnam in one year and cut the fund off. He didn't. He couldn't get at first one co-sponsor to go with him. But when I raised the question later to him of a filibuster, he said, Dan, if I could get people to join me, I do it," he said. "But if you do it as one person, you're going to look ridiculous. And in this job, you cannot afford to look ridiculous. So here was a senator Gravel who was willing to look ridiculous if necessary. You know, or all all by himself. He wasn't asking anybody else to join. So I said, "Is it true you're going to do this?" And you said, uh, "Yes, I am going to do it." I said, "Well, if you really want to read stuff, I can give you enough to read till Christmas. It will keep you busy till Christmas." And, and mind you, I'm dyslexic, so, so it would have been to <laughs> read. Right. Actually, a lot more than that. It's uh, it's tough reading, as you found when you were reading it into the record. <clears throat> Hard to read it. It was so terrible. In fact, I remember the point that where you really gave up, where you said. We are sending people over there to die and to kill for a government of drug dealers, uh, you know, and, and pushers, basically, which was exactly right and very hard to say. Okay, so you were very unusual at that point. Uh, you were face, you did face censure for it, as I recall. And uh, wasn't it Mike Mansfield, I think, who uh, interceded for you at that yeah, point? Yeah, Gerald Ford, uh, with, a, with a Gerald Ford with a bevy of Republicans, uh, went to see Mansfield over that weekend. And uh, I hadn't seen Mansfield yet. And uh, Mansfield, they walked in to see Mansfield, and they said, well, we want to talk to you about Gravel. And, and he immediately made the statement, I don't know of anything wrong that Gravel has done. Yeah. And that was the end of the meeting. They just walked out because they knew they couldn't persuade the leader. Now, well, that, I went to see him. Well, Rick, you, actually put, you know, tried to put or did what you could to put this other top secret stuff, a national security study memorandum run uh, into the Senate and were blocked by it. And you'll recall that um, they actually uh, assigned a committee. I think it was um, Javits and somebody else, maybe Gary Hart or somebody, was to look into the question of whether they could declassify in the Senate 
uh, classified material. And they came back later in a closed session, which was you know, not allowed to be printed in the congressional record for a long time. Eventually it got declassified. In and that, uh, they said, you know, it's very strange. Uh, as far as we can tell, we do have the, the right to do this. It's not clear that we'd be breaking any law by doing it. Uh, nevertheless, that didn't mean they were ready to do it. And when I asked Mike many years later, uh, in, in 2006, when we had hoped to get an impeachment uh, proceeding going against George W. Bush, and uh, Representative Conyers had not only promised that he would hold impeachment hearings, but he had written a book about it, How to Impeach the President, that summer. And he was told by then Speaker Nancy Pelosi, when the new term started, you will not proceed with impeachment proceedings on the grounds that that would bring the Republicans in and would doom the prospects of any uh, new president. We're reliving that right now, obviously. I would say the same issues are arising and uh, we'll see how that works out. But I was so disappointed that how little we got out of the 2006 class that came in there. You know, the Democrats took the House then, remember? Just like right. now. And we got very, very little out of that. Uh, from the Democrats. And I remember asking Mike on that question, uh, Mike, do you think these are extraordinarily cowardly uh, congressmen? And he said, no, ordinarily cowardly. He said it was exactly the same 40 years ago. And uh, so it goes. Now, to get into the, the question of how this relates to Julian right now, Assange, uh, what he's facing is not only the kind of treatment that John received in prison. But I think it's almost sure that, um, and I think, by the way, John, you did experience, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, some disciplinary issues where you were put in isolation for a while. Is that true? Uh, no, I, they, I was threatened with isolation a number of times, uh, threatened with uh, solitary confinement. And it was because I was writing a blog from prison and for the life of them, they couldn't figure out how I was getting it out. And the uh, truth of the matter is that I was putting it in an envelope, addressing it. In what? The truth of the matter is what? I didn't hear it. Oh, I, I, they couldn't figure out how I was getting this blog out of prison. But the truth is I was just sticking it in an envelope, putting a stamp on it, and throwing it into the mailbox. <laughs> uh, <right>. Well, <laughs> well, they're sadistic, but they're not very bright either. They're not. <laughs> the analogy there, though, given what I've said already, I have to leave Julian aside, aside for just a minute and tell this analogous story. Um, when Mike was gonna put this National Security Study Memorandum 1, the answers to it, which were answers to questions on Vietnam. They were extremely embarrassing. Written the questions by somebody who, as they say in the Pentagon, knew where the bodies were buried. So the answers were very embarrassing to the administration, uh, potentially, if they got out. So I gave them to uh, Mike Greville, and he tried to put them, as I just said, into the congressional record, and they blocked him. This is classified information. We can't put that in the record. Then uh, on May 3rd, 1972, there was an event uh, where we were having a rally. It was during the offensive in Vietnam of 1972. The Arvin, our mercenaries in effect, people we were paying and equipping and equipping, were fleeing from Way uh, and uh, Da Nang south. Uh, discarding that day, discarding their helmets and their boots as they ran, which seemed very strange uh, to people. Uh, when they read stories about it, they said, what's going on? What is this uh, giving out? I said, having spent two years in Vietnam and worked with Arvin troops, I said, I know exactly what they're doing. This is on the steps of the Capitol on May 3rd, 1972. And I gave a, a talk about it to a good rally crowd. I said, I know exactly what they're doing. They are throwing away American helmets and American boots, which they are wearing, because A, they don't want to be caught uh, to be make it clear that they were in Arvin, the people who were working basically for a foreign government, the United States, and that unlike the Viet Cong or unlike the uh, North, North Vietnamese Army, they were wearing the uniform of foreigners, uh, and that was not something they wanted to be caught with exactly. It was kind of a David, uh, let me interrupt a minute. Uh, yeah. Is that meeting that you're talking about at the Capitol, 
uh, that's when the, the uh, plumbers were so, supposed to break your legs, right? That's right. At that very time, you were, you were giving us talk. Ron Dellums was there. Uh, Bella Abzug was there. Uh, there are a number of people, including some Hollywood people talking. And um, it occurred to me, and, and they had brought up, I didn't know this at the time, but as we were all there on the steps of the Capitol, there were 12 CIA assets, as they call them, from the Bay of Pigs, Cuban Americans who had been in the Bay of Pigs, who were brought up from Miami uh, with the first money, actually, the illegal campaign contribution from Dwayne Andreas was spent to take them up to DC. They were shown my picture and a couple others said, your job is to incapacitate Ellsberg totally. I knew this uh, a year later when it came out uh, during the Watergate and, uh, and it helped end my trial, actually. But at that time, we didn't know it. None of them knew that they were in the crowd uh, prepared to incapacitate me totally. But it suddenly occurred to me, since you had just been blocked from putting this material into the Senate congressional record, that maybe there was a chance we could get it in the House congressional record. So I called over an aide to Conyers uh, in the House and spoke to him and said, uh, here's an idea, maybe you can do this. He went over and talked to his boss, Ron Dellums, and then uh, from my area here in the Bay Area, and then talked to you. And you may not remember this, but you held up, you saw me in the crowd and you held up your hand like this. And you said, it's okay, it's going to happen. So uh, when, when um, Kiriaka was talking about putting it in the middle, here's what happened. Uh, the aide uh, that night uh, told me later, uh, he, this is 500 pages of top secret documents. So he uh, is copied them. I think he copied them on a, as you had done on a, on a machine and um, put them in the hopper for the, um, uh, just put it in the hopper to be put in the congressional record for the next day because Dellums had said, I ask unanimous consent to extend my remarks. I'll give you some documents. And that's what he did. So he's sitting there wondering what is going to happen now uh, if anybody takes a good look at these documents. He gets a call from the government printing officer, whoever it is, puts out the congressional record. And he's afraid they're going to say the jig is up. But the question was, gee, we've never had somebody put in 500 pages before. Would you mind if we extend it over two days? So they did extend it over two days. And there in the House congressional record is 500 pages of top secret and secret documents, which the Senate had just decided they couldn't do entirely. So it's exactly like John popping this envelope into the, into the mail and getting it through. <laughs> coming, coming back now to, uh, oh, and then they passed what became known as the Dillon's Rule, that you couldn't put in more than 10 or 20 pages without somebody looking at it and getting more approval than they had before. And as far as I know, that's gone on. So we, we changed the procedure there. Now, Julian uh, would be not only threatened with uh, uh, isolation, he's extradited to this country, uh, before there's a trial or anything else, I am virtually certain that he would be not only put in prison immediately with no bail, but in isolation from the beginning. And he would stay there for the rest of his life. Chelsea Manning had this experience from Kuwait on when she came back, then Bradley, when she came back and was put in prison at Quantico, my old base where I went to Officer Candidate School and basic school when I was in the Marines. Um, She's in isolation uh, in, a, in a jail right there for 10 and a half months. And the only way she got out of that was public pressure and centered what not the word. Nobody could get in to see her, including representatives who tried to see her. No journalist from the time she was arrested in Kuwait until seven and a half years later, she was uh, commuted, the sentence was commuted by Obama and she got out at the end of Obama's term. No reporter had ever been able to talk to her. No interview, however, for seven and a half years. Uh, mm. Ed Snowden took counsel from that experience and knew that if he was going to interact with newsmen, as he did do, and is still doing, about the meaning of the documents he was giving them and how to interpret them and what the acronyms meant and uh, many things that had to be explained about the things, he had to be out of the country. 
The same would be, uh, now Julian would be in isolation for the same reason as Snowden. And that is, they were working at stuff that was much higher than the top secret crap that uh, Gravel experienced when he was in the army. And a lot of the Pentagon Papers are very boring and very uh, nothing, really. Uh, uh, 7,000 pages of that stuff uh, has a lot of stuff that didn't have to be put out. I put it out so that I wouldn't be accused of having censored the material myself or having redacted it. So I put it all out, even though it wasn't all that interesting. Now, Chelsea and Ed Snowden uh, had information, which they gave to Julian Assange, I should say, which uh, Chelsea gave to Julian Assange, which was much higher than top secret. Communications intelligence material, again, you were probably dealing with that to some extent, Mike, when you were a uh, control officer. But this was, uh, this was communications intelligence and intercepts and so forth. They would claim, at least, to worry that each of them had many more secrets that they could tell, especially Snowden. And uh, Snowden, I think, would be in prison for the rest of his life in isolation so that he couldn't tell people in the general prison population his secrets that he still had to put out and they could communicate them one way or another. That would be their excuse for giving maximum punishment and setting the strongest possible example to anybody else who might uh, want to uh, serve, follow their heroic example. So isolation would be their uh, fate, I think, essentially for the rest of their lives. And that is regarded, of course, as total uh, torture. Anything uh, they, I was just reading the other day, beyond 15 days is uh, regarded by Amnesty International and many psychologists and others as torture, cruel and inhumane treatment. And uh, that's, that's what they would be suffering. Uh, my friend Mordecai Venunu, who revealed the uh, Israeli program, nuclear program, in Israel, including uh, their probable H-bomb uh, arsenal, uh, was, in, was in isolation, as I recall, for 11 and a half years. Not 10 and a half months, but 11 and a half years out of what I think was a total 17 year sentence. And it wasn't real good for his mental balance while he was in the isolation. He recovered a lot when he got in the general prison population. So that's what Julian is facing. Uh, I've been saying for years now, it's been years, uh, that uh, Julian has been, in effect, in, uh, incarcerated one way or another, uh, that uh, he was absolutely right in believing, uh, in my opinion, that he would be extradited and that he would suffer this fate after a trial which would not be a fair trial. Uh, it's not possible for a whistleblower to be indicted under the Espionage Act, as they all have been, essentially, and get a fair trial because he or she cannot uh, argue to the jury that why they did what they did or what public interest was served, whether there was uh, have testimony from experts as to whether there was any damage uh, or whether there was any benefit to the only uh, the, the intention and the, would be regarded as irrelevant as it was in my own case. I was not, I was the first person prosecuted uh, on these grounds for a leak, uh, top secret leak back in 1971 to 73. And when I got on the stand for four and a half days, my lawyer asked me, why did you copy the Pentagon Papers? And I had saved a lot of details uh, so that I could give them under oath at that time. I was not allowed to answer that question. Prosecutor said, objection, irrelevant. And the judge held it up, uh, accepted that. My lawyer tried different ways of getting the question through, Leonard Boudin, and finally said, Your Honor, I have never heard of a case when the defendant was not allowed to tell the jury why uh, he did what he did. And the judge said, well, you're hearing one now. And that was the extent. Now, my trial ended under extraordinary circumstances, uh, unprecedented and almost unparalleled since. It's kind of a miracle. Uh, that I got off since my judge had been offered his life's ambition, if that trial came out all right and quickly enough, namely to replace J. Edgar Hoover, who had just died, as the head of the FBI. And uh, uh, he, he dismissed that as a grounds for ending the trial when it came out, when it was leaked out. 
uh, he said it hadn't affected him uh, at all, that offer. But eventually, uh, having found that I'd been uh, criminally overheard uh, wireless wart warrior tapping and his effort to kill me and so forth, incapacitate me totally, various things led to my not going to prison. But even I would probably have been allowed to be in the general prison population because for my 115 year sentence, if I'd gotten it, because the material I put out was only top secret. And uh, uh, Chelsea's material, um, rather than not, uh, what she put out was secret or less, that's much lower category, or unclassified. What Snowden put out was higher than top secret. And uh, Assange put out stuff, uh, they would just put him in, in isolation, I think, just to punish him for his years of uh, irreverence toward the, uh, toward the uh, intelligence establishment and the classification system. Now, I've, as I've said, no possibility of a fair trial, assurance that he would be extradited. As I said, I've been predicting that for years and other people said, oh no, he's just staying there because he doesn't want to spend a few months in jail in England for having jumped his bail and gone to the Ecuadorian ministry. And many respectable journalists and others less respectable, but many have said that's the only reason he's staying in. It's just to protect himself from a few months in jail. Now, I felt I had come to know Julian Assange well enough to know that was not true. Uh, that he, in fact, when he told me that he was absolutely prepared to uh, uh, go to jail in, in uh, Britain for a matter of months or even a year or two. I forget what the maximum would have faced for that. His only concern was life in prison or uh, in, in the US. I was sure that was true. And let me say something about it, uh, about Julian that uh, not everybody is in a position to say, having not met him, uh, and uh, or would say, frankly, even if they had met him. Because Julian is a very unpopular person. He's gotten, I would say, an extremely bad press, including from the New York Times, from the very first moment that they printed his material. Uh, they treated him the way they treated me, but that's another story. As, as I told him, I got pretty much the same treatment from the New York Times. Uh, they, they don't like sources very much. My guess is that uh, they think of sources to them the way pre, pre, uh, police think of their snitches, uh, namely necessary, important, uh, important for uh, their careers and justice process, but basically bad people who betrayed their promise to keep secrets and they're opposing U.S. policy and they're not patriotic. Anyway, that's the way, frankly, I was treated. But Assange was a little shocked that he was treated that way, but he was, as was Chelsea exactly the same way. More important than that though, was that he subsequently got very bad press from people. Uh, in years when I said he absolutely did not deserve it, I'm prepared to say that his activities in the last couple of years, 2016 and so forth, are rightly controversial. And I by no means agree with his judgment on, uh, on all the things that, that he chose. I cut somebody a lot of slack who's been in one psychologically and in terms of judgment, who's been in one room or one little suite of office for six years. I don't know. I think that would affect my mental and emotional balance very significantly or anybody else's. And I don't judge him very much for his judgments in the last few years, frankly, though I can disagree and I do disagree with uh, a, a number of those judgments. But having said that, I don't say that to separate myself from my unconditional support for his, his need for uh, uh, the asylum, which he deserves in other places and he has in Ecuador, uh, my unreserved condemnation of Ecuador for washing their hands of someone to whom they've offered asylum, rightly so, and uh, for their political purposes. And I'm gonna go one step further. As I said, a lot of people who've seen movies about him, which I, which I think in, in every case were extremely unfair to him and biased. And I say that in the, in the following, pardon me, I say that in the following context, sorry, following context. 
um, <clears throat> that a lot of people who have met Julian, he's not their cup of tea and he doesn't like them. And I'm not sure I would like to work for him, as a matter of fact, from what I've heard about uh, his, uh, his, his autocratic behavior and uh, toward, towards subordinates in general. I wasn't his subordinate. I met him for several days in England uh, when, he was, when he was, and I was helping him put out the Iraq war logs, which I helped him do at a press conference. And elsewhere, I spent several days with him there. I visited him in his Ecuadorian asylum uh, twice now. And as I say, many people, first of all, you don't have to like Julian Assange or even approve of what he's done in terms of judgment um, uh, in, the, in the last few years or ever in, in order to be totally supportive of his asylum and opposed to his being tried on espionage act uh, charges, which would be of extreme ominous significance for the press in this country and everywhere else. So basically wiping out the First Amendment to a very large extent in terms of freedom of the press. Uh, he would be the example of a publisher and a journalist, they would use it for that, uh, who was actually indicted and convicted, and it would cool a lot of journalism, uh, other than uh, handouts uh, and official channels for authorized leaks. There would be some people who would risk jail, uh, like James Risen, uh, and others, I think people that I dealt with, like Neil Sheehan and others, uh, Henrik Smith, would have risked prison uh, in the face of the, of, the, of the possibility of prosecution. But a lot of them won't. As Mike said of Congress, ordinarily cowardly affects, affects every profession, uh, journalism, uh, prof politics, and everything else. So a successful prosecution and conviction of Julian would be a tremendous cooling effect on any reporting of national security. But I say the unusual context I want to put this in is this. I don't know who, how many people I've heard say this. Having met Julian, knowing his circumstances, and the, the courage that he showed at various points uh, earlier in doing what he should have done. I liked Julian Assange when I met him first. I liked him on the visits that I made with him. There were many people, as I say, who there's an enormous number of people who have not met him or seen him only on movies who do not like him. There are many people who hate him. I am not in either of those camps. I am someone who liked Julian Assange, respected him, admired him. I could even see, say, when I saw what he was going through in that embassy year after year, I loved him. I not only sympathize with his plight, but I felt, uh, I, I feel love for this person. And uh, I admire him. So I have a personal aspect on this. And uh, again, without feeling I have to endorse and don't endorse uh, everything that he's done, uh, as a matter of being best judgment or anything else, I feel absolutely committed to keeping him out of an isolation cell. Could I raise something that's a different uh, segue? And that is that uh, what we're doing uh, we have to be realistic and realize that we're not going to influence the government. Uh, that's the sad nature of it. And so if he's not, uh, you know, the chances of saving Julian before this thing plays out are difficult. What I'm wondering is, could we not uh, incite riots in uh, Britain that would then move, move towards the embassy are there not enough peace groups out there that, and journalists in Britain that I don't have any contacts uh, with journalists there, but if they could turn around and get a, get a brown vest or a red vest and put it on as a group and, and go to the embassy and, and screw it up, just, just get a, uh, thousands of people around the embassy, that might suggest a possibility of sneaking him out. And that's what I've always felt that the answer to this is, is if we could get a, a billionaire who could put forth the money to get helicopters and do, and, and do this, we could probably get them to safety. But absent that, I'm very pessimistic about how 
uh, how this is going to be handled by the by Trump, uh, the Trump government. So that's just my two cents. Uh, I, I always take the positive and let's fight, but not, not just talk. Let's just fight and see. If, I don't know. See if there's an element in Britain uh, that might want to step up to the plate and do something in that regard. Just a thought. Will be possible, and Mike, you know, there aren't too many. You're the former senator who would come up with that idea and be speaking from somebody who was willing to take risks like that and did take the risks. And I appreciate it. And by the way, it's it's very pertinent. It does remind me of something, frankly, that I've never, I've scarcely ever mentioned. People in in London knew about it, uh, who were then supporting him. Uh, but uh, on my first visit, I think it was there. He had just been refused. Uh, we, we arrived to do a uh, visit, and we were told a new consul or whatever the person in charge of the, that embassy was, was um, had arrived, not sympathetic to Julian, and was forbidding anyone to come in to see him, which was certainly his right under the asylum rules, and that we couldn't get in to see him. And uh, so I had decided that, uh, and I said it on the phone, which may have been very helpful uh, to some of the people we were working on. Said and said, said, I'm going to go tomorrow morning and I'm going to sit in front of that doorway at the embassy and nobody's going to get in except over my body until they'll have to arrest me. Uh, you know, I had some experience with the power of civil disobedience <laughs> and I thought that, that'll, uh, that'll give them some. Well, we got there, and by God, the rule had just changed. And of course, we took it for granted that our, I, I hadn't had this in mind when I said it over the phone, but I didn't have any doubt that that had been uh, noted, as a matter of fact. And so you're, you're right, though. Uh, I think actions like that where it would be absolutely appropriate, uh, find creative ways to bring the attention of the people. As I said earlier, the idea that he was going, that there was a secret indictment was being dismissed as paranoia and grandstanding by uh, Julian and his lawyers for a long time. I was sure that was not the case. Well, now we know it isn't. <laughs> they made a mistake and they admitted that they have indicted him. So that has vindicated that thing, which has gone on for years now, you know, is did he have a, a basic uh, need to stand on his asylum rights and stay in that place? Well. Uh, one last thing, my wife just came down to call me. I'd promised her I would get out at this time. But I think I have to uh, put that off. And to, to make the, um, the following point, they have said that they will not send him to a place where he faces a death penalty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did not face a death penalty. Uh, uh, Chelsea Manning did, essentially. And... Uh, uh, Ed Snowden, they might or might not choose to do that, but that's in this country. It depends on the charges they raise. Well, the U.S. is, of course, a place where he would potentially face the death penalty. So the question in my mind is, Ecuador is saying now we've been assured that that's not an issue. They haven't come right out and say that I know of. That means that he can be sent to the United States. Uh, a way around that could be, we have been assured that we won't seek the death penalty uh, on these charges. But that's pretty, and that they might take as reason enough. Okay, uh, in theory, we don't extradite somebody to a place that can face the death penalty. But in this case, uh, he's been assured he won't, he won't get those charges. In the case of Chelsea Manning, her charges, her charge list definitely included a possible death penalty. But the prosecutor said, we won't go that far. We will not ask for the death penalty. But it was very clear, the judge, and he didn't have a jury, she didn't have a jury, uh, the judge would make the decision on sentencing the end. And the judge could have decided to give the death penalty. The prosecutors would not bind the judge's hand on that. So there's a lot of murkiness here. Uh, I want to repeat, there's no question in my mind that he should not be sent to the United States here for 10 different reasons, but one of which is that he could not possibly get a fair trial. We don't have an official Secrets Act as Britain does, and whether that's fair enough, 
fair or not, if he'd violated British law, I'm sorry, if he had done this in Britain, rather, it would be fairly clear that he had violated the Official Secrets Act. The same would have been true for me. But in our country, we don't have an Official Secrets Act. Why not? We had a revolution. We didn't pass the Official Secrets Act that British did. We have a First Amendment, which very few other countries do have. And uh, Britain does not have, as a matter of fact. So we don't have an act that is regarded as constitutional uh, under which he can be tried. He should not be tried here. And I would say, let me make this, I said the very dramatic, uh, just in terms of media today, the, the amazing statement, I like Julian Assange, even if I don't like everything he's done and all this, but I, I like, him. I'll make another um, uh, dramatic statement here. Well, well, I leave it at that. He, uh, he should not be sent back. Uh, it would not be fair to do so. He deserves strong support. And as Mike Gravel just said, that definitely includes the possibility of acts, nonviolent acts of protest and obstruction if these uh, wrongs are uh, waged against him. Uh, that is very much in line with what should happen. May I interject uh, as, a, uh, as the next senior person after Mike and Dan? May I say something? I mean, yes. Okay. Uh, you're yeah, Dan, really a junior here, I believe. What you remember, what you're talking about, the death penalty and all, brings back a flashback when our Supreme uh, lawyer, Eric Holder, uh, after, after Ed Snowden ended up in Moscow, he wrote an official memorandum under Justice Department stationery saying to his opposite number, the head prosecutor in, in, in Russia, look, please give Ed back. We promise not to torture him and we promise not to kill him. And I'm saying, my God, <laughs> Eric Holder said that in this official memo to the Justice Department of Russia. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> And so here you go. It's, it's the same sort of thing. Now, I think solitary, con solitary confinement for the rest of your life is worse than, worse than death. Uh, but I'm um, against the death penalty, of course. I, too, uh, would add that I like, I love Julius. He's my friend, okay? I'm a good friend. And I don't have a problem with anything that he's done. And I, I think that uh, you're quite right, Dan, in saying that if the only time you see Julian is when he's standing up, facing into the man, you know, facing into the people of persecuting him, well, he comes across as a little arrogant. Well, hell, he should be arrogant, given what he's, what he's, so it's a bum rap, in my view. He's a very warm person, one-on-one, -on -one, and the first time we saw him in the embassy in Ecuador, we were celebrating the Sam Adams Award for that year, Man, we had just a wonderful time. He had only been there two years. Now it's going into seven, I think. So I give him some arrogance. If it appears like arrogance, I give him, I give him every benefit of the doubt. When I was with him three days before the election in November of 2016, he, had, he was spent. He had done all he could to make sure that enough information that he was, that he was privy to got out into the open with the help of people like you and John Pilger, he, he did this. And the, the notion that he, would, that he would be brought back here where he has no business being here and subjected to the Espionage Act, you know, it's just too much. Boy, if I could say, I, I just remembered, I agree with you, Ray, totally with everything you said there. It, it occurred to me what I was about to say, the other dramatic uh, uh, thought I would say, uh, which slipped my mind as a senior moment since I'm 87, much older than you, Ray, and almost mm -hmm. as old as Mike Gravel, it was this. I would be just as strong, this is going to be hard to believe, but it's true. I would be just as strong against the extradition in the same circumstances of Stephen Bannon uh, or anybody else I could name. Uh, <laughs> or I would be as strong against stopping a publication of Breitbart News, you know, which is <laughs> totally a purveyor of vicious, you know, racist, uh, terrible, inflammatory stuff. 
under the Espionage Act, let's say, as for Mike Gravel or uh, Mike Gravel or Tom Drake or Justin Reddick or any of the other people who have faced faced that issue. It, it's not a question of politics. And I, I really do uh, trust myself that I would be as strong to oppose that abuse of the Espionage Act against these people with whom I totally disagree their politics as I am with Julian Assange. One small detail, Mike, uh, not relevant here, but I think uh, everyone needs to know the prestigious committee that you were, or the prestigious subcommittee that you were chair of when you took advantage of your prestigious position at this head of that subcommittee to get one of its members and then read the Pentagon papers. So what, what committee that, that committee? That committee was the least prestige committee in the public works. And it was buildings and grounds. <laughs> the rake and go out and rake in front of the Capitol. <laughs> I was to be doing my duty. But, but we didn't have, you know, one of the things that's not generally known that the young attorneys that were advising me uh, when I couldn't do it on the floor, uh, they said, well, there's a precedent that permits you to use your committee. And I said, what's the precedent? The House Un-American Activities Committee. That was the precedent that permitted us to get away with what we did. <laughs> Who knows? Might, Boy, this, might, go ahead. You might also mention how it was you were able to stand for hours and hours without having to go off to the men's room. <laughs> well, I, I, had, I had a colostomy bag uh, and, uh, and put on me, and so did Alan Cranston because he was going to be in a chair. And okay. then I had an enema down at the, and the, the, I had to talk it over with the doctor down in the Senate. And so we had this, we had this all physically figured out. And my chief of staff, his job was to come up and have a little, little bleed valve down by my ankle. And his <laughs> job was to go ahead and bleed it. And I didn't have a, it was, had to be chief of staff. Just, we weren't messing around. 